There's a blue heart for you, look. It's not even cursed or nothing. It's more, I don't know, it's just more modern. I'm sorry for your troubles, Cadwallader. Tavernier was Tavorn to death. Who should have her? Hello, Sotheby's. Yeah, I found a massive shiny thing. Yeah, it's really massive. <laughs> Ooh, it's mysterious. Back up, back up. Warning, this video contains descriptions which some viewers may find distressing, as well as a clatter of bad words. If you wish to exit now, we won't hold it against you. Come on into the ditch. I'm your resident ditch witch, Tara Tyne, and we're about to get witchy, whether you like it or not. Welcome back, my fellow ditchlings. If it's your first time here, then it's just welcome. If you like history, folklore, and all things witchy, go ahead and hit subscribe so you can see my videos whenever I upload them. So after my recent trip to Hope Castle in County Monaghan, I started watching videos about the Curse of the Hope Diamond, which was owned by the same family. The more I read, the more I felt like I'd been a little bit remiss in not mentioning it in the Castle Blaney video. I am, after all, the Ditch Witch. So, here we are. Do you like my makeup? Look, it's been a long time since I painted a face, okay? I busted out the industrial strength glitter and all. The look is actually inspired by the Hope Diamond itself because imitation is the highest form of flattery and even though the myth of the curse is a little bit dubious, I was taking no chances. There's already been a few blips trying to get this video together. As such, I have also made the appropriate offerings Please don't curse me, please don't curse me, please don't curse me to Sita, the Hindu goddess from whom the diamond was thought to have been stolen about 350 years ago, but we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves there. Back up, back up. The Hope Diamond has been coveted by many throughout history, though owned by few. And some of those died in kind of horrible ways. It even had time to inspire the Heart of the Ocean necklace in James Cameron's 1997 movie, Titanic. Did anyone else gasp when that sweet old lady just hoofed it into the ocean? <laughs> anyway, the diamond was actually formed about a billion years ago and was extracted from the earth sometime before 1666 in the Kolur mine, Gontur. Mm -hmm. I hope I said that right. In the area known today as Andhra Pradesh in India. It's one of a range of world famous diamonds which originated from the Golconda Sultanate, some of which are included now amongst the crown jewels of the world, and some of which are lost. So if you happen to come across a gargantuan shiny thing in your great auntie's attic, don't throw it on the costume jewellery pile just yet. Hello Sotheby's. Yeah, I found a massive shiny thing. Yeah, it's really massive and shiny. So as the story goes, when the diamond was plucked from the earth, it was placed in a temple in the eye of Sita, the wife of Rama, who was the seventh avatar of Vishnu. Try saying that ten times fast. There appears to be no evidence of where this temple actually is, but if that's the evidence you need, then might I suggest that a YouTube video about a cursed diamond might not be the optimal viewing choice for you, hmm? Diamond is said to have been stolen from Sita and when the temple priests realise this they are said to have placed a curse upon whoever would subsequently own the diamond. <laughs> First person on record as having owned it was gem merchant Jean-Baptiste Tavernier. Thank you very much. And according to May Yoe, a later owner of the diamond who had a vested interest in talking up its reputation, Tavernier was torn to death by wild dogs. No, except he wasn't. 
and actually he died a wealthy and seemingly happy man in Russia in his 80s. Some would say that this is the first and the last proof you need that the story of the curse is hokum, but hear me out. Tavernier is thought to have actually been the original diamond thief who took the piece from Sita. This wouldn't be surprising since it's without a doubt how many tycoons in the business of dealing artifacts made their money back in the day and possibly still except pillaging and theft are done by more professional and legal looking means these days. <laughs> See every museum you've ever visited. I said what I said. Now, I don't know Sita, but if I was a goddess, I'd probably be a smart arse and I'd skip over to Vernier with my curse because A, as the thief, I would poke my own eye out before acknowledging him as a rightful owner of my eye that he stole and B, maybe I knew that there were bigger fish to fry if I just had a little bit of patience. Of course, the diamond's current home, the Smithsonian Museum, insists on their website that Tavernier bought the stone, but they would like. Tavernier himself, despite his extensive writings, seems to have completely forgotten to mention how he came to own the diamond on one of his many plunderous, sorry, adventurous trips to India, so... Yeah. Anyway, it's now 1668, Tavernier has the jewel, it's about the size of a man's fist and it weighs 112 carats and Sita's patience is about to pay off. Tavernier gets summoned to the court of none other than the Sun King himself, Louis XIV. Louis bought a heap of jewels from him, including the diamond which was cut at Louis's request into the shape of a love heart and named the French Blue. No. After being cut, it weighed a mere 67 carats. I mean, does that not kind of defy the point of owning a gigantic diamond though? Come on, like, massive diamond, cut it down, I don't know. Maybe it's something to do with having the power to cut such a fabulous diamond down to such a small size. I don't know. Or maybe there's something about jewels that I don't understand. Maybe something magic happens when you cut them. Let me know in the comments. I think the diamond as well was actually suffering from shock at this horrendously bad choice and bad taste. Because it took nearly 50 years to kill Louis with the curse using a variety of painful, embarrassing and above all inconvenient illnesses. In the end he was finished off by gangrene at Versailles. Now there's a name for a gothic punk band of every haired one. All six of his children died before him, although his eldest son did manage to produce an heir first, so it wasn't all bad luck for Louis. Now I'm really only planning on covering actual owners of the diamond in this video and a couple of owners by proxy, but two more names which May Yohe dredged up from the era of the Sun King when she was trying to big up her bling and it Hill count, all right, me. Where Nicolas Fouquet and the Marquise de Montespan, Francoise Athenaise de Rochoir. Did I say that right? And I said it with confidence. Yeah. The reason I'm including these two is because they're both people who may, in their more private moments, have momentarily believed themselves to have some kind of ownership over the diamond in a way, since they both took for granted their close associations with the French king and were both disgraced and destroyed because of it. Fouquet, the overly ambitious wee squirrel that he was, I'm not even being facetious, that was his family crest. Well, he served as the guardian of the French crown jewels during the first 18 years of Louis's reign. Rumours started that he'd worn the diamond on festive occasions. Did he ask permission? Did he feel like he needed to ask permission being sort of treasurer, guardian of, guardian of the crown jewels, you know? Wee bit of ownership mentality, maybe? Or perhaps he was just spurred on by his family motto, quo non ascendet. What heights will he not scale? I mean, the guy actually bought and fortified the French port of Belle Isle, so he'd have somewhere to escape to if ever he was disgraced. I shit you not. But of course, Louis was tricky, and he convinced Fouquet by crafty devices to sell off his position and all of its privileges and protections. He was then flattered into a trap 
by his 20-something year old king and imprisoned for life for financial mishandlings after a grueling three-year trial in what is today Pinerolo in Italy, where he had a famous valet, actually, the man in the iron mask. Hmm. I mean, how bad was the imprisonment, though, if he had a valet? Do you know, like, doing up his trousers, picking out his clothes, maybe helping him wash? I, I don't know. I don't know what a valet does, but I'm pretty sure you're not meant to have one in prison. Rich people. Anyway, Nicholas was allowed to see his wife only once after that in the 19 years before he died there. And that was pretty much the end of him. Then the Marquise de Montespan was also rumoured to have worn the diamond after working her way to the top dog of Louis's mistresses. Hmm. And aired in her own court at the palace and the unofficial nickname, the True Queen of France. Francoise was implicated but never charged in the affair of the poisons. Les affaires de poisson? I thought it was poisson but I think that's a fish. Anyway, it was an infamous scandal that took place in France in the late 1670s. It was basically implied that she'd hired a witch in order to win influence over the king and then possibly later hired a poisoner in order to kill off a rival after giving the king seven illegitimate children and then being overlooked for a younger, shinier duchess. Isn't that always the way? And of course, once those rumours started, you know, they had her actually taken part in black masses herself. So, as good as a witch, essentially, this mistress of Louis XIV. In the end, she was paid to leave the palace and lived out the rest of her life in exile as a nun in a Carmelite monastery just down the road in Paris, though. I mean, you'd hardly even call that exile, really, to be honest. It was certainly the end of her social life and her high standing, which actually really was everything to these people. But she died of natural causes much later. Back to actual owners of the diamond, then you've got Louis the 15th, who started out well enough, you know? He was called Louis the Beloved by his subjects during the youthful days of his reign. But by the time he died at 64 years of age, he had unwittingly left the monarchy ripe for the event of the French Revolution and was in fact hated by his subjects as much as his great-grandfather before him had been. His role in the diamond's history was to have it cut again into a piece of ceremonial jewellery for the Order of the Golden Fleece. And that was Louis. Then Louis the 16th and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Some say Marie Antoinette wore the gemstone, others say she didn't. Either way, herself and Louis were both beheaded in their 30s as a result of the French Revolution. Pierre Cartier once tried to convince socialite Evelyn Walsh Maclean that this was the wrath of the Hope Diamond striking again. He left out the bit about the starving, impoverished French people who got sick of the ridiculous excesses of their monarchy and decided to execute them. But nevertheless, the sales tax and blatant lies worked. Evelyn bought it hook, line and sinker. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Too excited. The glitter. Before we leave France, I just want to draw some attention to this image I found of poor old Marie Therese of France. You never really hear about her. She was the eldest and only surviving daughter of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette after the revolution. She was technically Queen of France for 20 minutes on the 2nd of August 1830 due to some incredibly boring bureaucracy. That dress looks like it just arrived in the post from Amazon. She didn't even bother ironing it, like. She's like, fuck it, it's only for 20 minutes. I was quite happy arsing round on the shells till you came and I and me with all this Queen of France stuff. Do you not remember what happened to the last person that called themselves a queen round these parts? Bloody mortified. Anyway, Marie Therese lived a fairly long and tragic life. I wonder if anyone ever told her it could have been worse. She might have owned the Hope Diamond. But of course by then it had been claimed back by the state and then stolen from the French treasury shortly after the revolution. The French blue next showed up almost exactly two decades later in 1812. Coincidentally, of course, that would have been the time limit on the statute of limitations on theft in a time of war in France had it been applied, which of course it wasn't. And when it showed up again, it was in the possession of another gem merchant, Daniel Eliasson in London. 
And there's no written record of where the diamond spent the next few decades, although a jewel that looked suspiciously identical to it was recorded in paintings of England's George IV during his contemporaneous reign. And George IV, like so many other monarchs and owners of the Hope Diamond, had more money than sense. He died in massive debt and slovenly excess after a 10 year reign and was universally hated by his people. I'm starting to notice a pattern here. His estate was sold off upon his death to recover debts and so the hope was on the move again. And society was changing now. Monarchies were falling and being replaced by the new elite, the bankers and the socialites. By 1832, the diamond had been bought by Henry Philip Hope, the second son of a wealthy Dutch banking family based in London, for a large discount from a merchant who was badly in need of the money. Finally, yes, the Hopes. Hope Diamond, Hope Castle, it's coming together now, isn't it? Sort of. Anyway, Henry died without children in 1839 and his nephew, Henry Thomas Hope, inherited his estate, including the diamond. Top rich people tip, name your child after your richest relative to increase chances of inheriting. Even if there's already 15 other Henrys in the family, you know, they mightn't all survive. Never know. Henry Jr.'s siblings subsequently fell out with him and it was in 1853 that he purchased Blaney Castle from the 12th and final Baron Blaney whose name was Cadwallader Davis Blaney. I'm sorry for your troubles Cadwallader. In fact, I'm sorry for the troubles of anyone called Cadwallader but I don't think there would be too many people called that these days. Let me know if you are. If your name is Cadwallader, let me know in the comments. And let me know what people call you. Caddy. Wally. Is that where Wally comes from? Is that what people who are named Wally were christened? I need, I need to know. You need to tell me. Willie is William. Wally, I'm pretty sure is not William. So after Henry's death in 1862, his wife Adele inherited the diamond. And rather than passing it down to her one time illegitimate but now legitimate only child and daughter Henrietta, what, was that not close enough to Henry? Should Adele have actually just named her daughter Henry? Or what, like, what do you people want? So yeah, instead it went to her grandson, Henry Francis Hope Pelham Clinton Hope 8, Duke of Newcastle underlined. And a new precedent was set that not only did you have to be called Henry, but you better stick hope in there twice, to be sure. <laughs> this Henry inherited the estate in 1884 on the basis that he could never sell any part of it. He also decided it was now safe to drop the Henry part and overnight Lord Francis Hope became a thing. For two years he served as the Sheriff of Monaghan, aka the upholder of British oppression and tyranny in this part of Ireland after the famine's last genocide. But he didn't seem particularly interested in oppressing Ireland or actually living here even as far as I can make out. He was busy with his lavish lifestyle in London and had his sights set on the American singer slash actress slash burlesque performer slash Queen of the London stage, Mae Yohei, who would wear one knicker perched provocatively above her knee to delight her audiences. I bet she did. All of a sudden the rules around Francie's inheritance started to feel a little too restrictive. A bit like Mae's knicker leg. Francis and Mae were young and in love and everyone agreed that those crazy kids had expensive bloody taste. They partied like it was 1899 so much so that they peaked a little bit too soon and after challenging his inheritance rights in court and eventually winning, by 1896, just two years after Murray and May, Francis was filing for bankruptcy again. But friggish, Franye weren't gonna let a little thing like bankruptcy get in their way. Just did a great Gatsby on it and in 1901 whilst on a dodging the creditors slash scrounging all friends world tour they fell in with the son of the mayor of New York a Captain Putnam Bradley Strong. What is it with these people and the names? Oh, oh. Putnam must have been the richest uncle. Mm. So anyway 
putty was devastatingly handsome and a personal favourite of President McKinley, if you don't mind. So yeah, May fell head over heels in love and instead of keeping him as her lover, like most upper class Victorian women would do, May simply refused to return to England with Lord Francis and went on to have a short and tempestuous relationship with the captain. Branier divorced in 1902 and May went on to have two more recorded marriages and several more alleged ones and at one point had been forced to take a position as a washerwoman at the Boston docks. That was a bit of a fall from her previously glittering stage career. And so in an attempt to revive said stage career, which she gave up after Marion Francis, by the way, Let's pause for a second and appreciate that maybe it wasn't just a case of me going, you know what, I've got a rich husband now, I need never work again. No learning lines for me, no ma'am. No, I don't think it was like that. I think in Victorian England, I think it was expected that when a, a particularly sort of upper class woman got married that she would give up her job. I think maybe giving up her career was a sign that she had married well or I look at I don't I don't know. She tried revamping the career anyway. She tried her best to cash in on her former stardom and press notoriety by writing, directing and promoting a silent film series entitled The Hope Diamond Mystery. The film was a work of fiction based on the diamond's supposed curse and had an all-star cast including Boris Karloff. May is titled as May Yohei, formerly Lady Frances Hope in the opening credits. The film wasn't terribly popular and neither was the vaudeville play which she later toured that was based on the film. And in 1938, May came to a pretty sad end at the age of 72. Her final husband, Captain John Smuts, who had been working as a janitor after their business had burned down, that was rough, had ongoing hospital bills which needed paying and May, whose financial situation had been steadily worsening over the years, took a job as a clerical worker at $16 per week. Per week, even in today's money, that's crap. So yeah, she was working at $16 a week in order to pay his medical bills. And she'd actually been turned down for the job in the first place because she had forfeited her American citizenship after Mary and Francis. She gave up so much to marry that man. And maybe it didn't seem like it when he was loaded, but it sure did now. So after getting her citizenship back and securing the job, Within weeks, she had died of heart and kidney disease without a penny to her name. Her most prized possession when she died was a personalized autograph on a photo of Edward VII. And then just a few months later, her husband died too. Like 72 years of age, working as a clerical worker, $16 a week after such a glittering career. That is just, that is sad. And she didn't even own the diamond anymore. It was long gone. And Francis, meanwhile, had remarried and had three little hopes, all who survived to adulthood. However, he did lose his leg in a hunting accident around the time that he had divorced May. And his second wife, unfortunately, died tragically young, just eight years after they were married. But, like, once his massive debts had been settled and he actually at one point inherited a dukedom from his brother, you know, because that's just how it works. Francis's privilege and family name saved him from a fate that was anywhere near as bleak as May's. But anyway, Q. Pierre Cartier. We've skipped a few names here because there were several gem dealers and a few private buyers who are said to have owned the diamond after Hope sold it around 1903. Some had great trouble selling it, some of them got into massive debt after buying it, and one sultan was reputed to have been deposed after supposedly purchasing the diamond. But details from this decade are incredibly sketchy and what we do know is that both Cartier and his soon-to-be client, wealthy socialite Evelyn Walsh McLean, had a vested interest in raising the reputation and therefore the value of the stone. Wikipedia reckons that even the story of its theft from a temple and the subsequent bad luck that it caused to its owners at the hands of Hindu priests 
bears a striking resemblance to an 1868 novel entitled The Moonstone. Cartier believed that the stone's reputation could actually be a selling point if spun correctly, and this was almost a decade before Edward Bernays invented public relations, although Bernays is listed as having advised the Cartier company, so it's potentially not really that impressive. In fact, I kept seeing references to how Cartier also embroidered the diamond's legend in order to entice Evelyn to buy. Here's another textile sound and way of putting it. He fabricated at least parts of the story. He also changed the stone setting in order to clinch the deal and it worked. Evelyn forked up the equivalent of a few million quid in today's money. Thereafter, she would insist publicly that the diamond brought her nothing but good luck. And she'd play hide and seek with it at parties, she'd let people try it on, she would allow her dog to wear it round the house. Sure, Evelyn, just like people allow their dogs to wear onesies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but her private life with the Hope Diamond was very different. Hashtag, what a surprise. Evelyn's firstborn son was unfortunately the victim in the first of several tragic instances in Evelyn's life when he passed away as a result of a car accident aged only nine in the year 1919. Her husband, an alcoholic, then flittered away their fortune, left her for another woman, and died in a mental institution. Evelyn, meanwhile, had to sell and buy back the Hope Diamond at a pawn shop at least once over the next few years when money was low and debt was high. Their family newspaper, The Washington Post, went bankrupt despite the stock market crash of 29. I mean, that must have been great for business. How do you still, how do you still go bankrupt? I, Look it. I don't make the news, I only report it. <laughs> I always wanted to say that. But then tragedy struck again in 1946 when Evelyn unfortunately found the body of her 25 year old daughter who was ruled to have died from an accidental overdose of sleeping pills. Evelyn herself was committed to a mental asylum a short time later where she died the following year of pneumonia. In her autobiography, the ever stoic socialite said, what tragedies have befallen me might have occurred had I never seen or touched the Hope Diamond. My observations have persuaded me that tragedies, for anyone who lives, are not escapable. I mean, it's bleak, but it's true. And Cartier is in the background going, Shh, shut up, will ya? Sick. So after Evelyn's death, even though the diamond was entrusted to her grandkids and couldn't be sold and if it was, there was this forfeit and that rule and yeah. As we've seen by now, these things are easily broken if you have enough money. And somehow, the mysterious gem dealer, Harry Winston, was somehow able to purchase Evelyn's entire jewellery collection at auction, despite her stipulation. But anyway, he was all like, yeah, I don't really believe in curses, but just in case, I'm not gonna wear it and I'm not gonna let my wife wear it and actually I think I might donate it to charity. And so he did. After several years of touring and lending out the Hope Diamond, he posted it to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington through the US Postal Service in a plain brown box. And there it remains to today. On display, obviously, not still in the box. Apparently it's in like a glass rotating tube or whatever. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, you know, definitely nothing bad has happened to Washington since the diamond arrived there in 1958. Nothing bad at all. So you probably found my opinion on the curse of the Hope Diamond to be about as easy to penetrate as the depths of the French blue itself. That's because I don't really have one. It's a story for people with more money than I have. Let them lose sleep over it if they want to. I'd be busy enough losing sleep over the unnecessary amount of glitter that lives in my eyeballs now. But if you do have a curse that needs dealing with, call 1-800-DITCHWITCH. The call's free, but the service isn't. Also, that's not a real phone number. Anyway, if you'd like to see more deep dives on cursed objects or people or places, 
Let me know in the comments. I pray guess in what you want and it's too hard. And also, if you're wondering how our watch hour count is going, it is fantastic. All we need, 300 more hours. So keep liking, commenting, sharing it. I really appreciate all of that. I see you, all of you, hitting those buttons, showing your friends, leaving a wee comment for me. And I love you. There's a blue heart for you, look. That's not even cursed or nothing. So hit subscribe for more fun and witchy adventures. I upload every Thursday and you're not gonna wanna miss it. Slon agus banacht. Goodbye and good luck to you. Glither, glither, glither. I mean glithering. I wouldn't fit in slithering. But glithering. That's... That's a different story. Oh my god, stop kicking the lights, Tara. Wow. <laughs> you wouldn't know I'm wearing my jammies. That's just for those of you still watching.